before we start today's episode, I just want to address something that some of our Crime After Crime family might be wondering about. The Netflix series Crime Scene dropped some heavy questions about internet detectives, and to some viewers, painted a picture where some of us featured were shown as being in some way responsible for harassment of someone that was in no way connected to the case. This in turn created a lot of harassment aimed at us that were featured. The director, Joe Berlinger, has spoken recently on a Netflix podcast called You Can't Make This Up to make an important clarification. And then the other unfortunate thing that's happened with, again, a handful of viewers, but people have made the incorrect conclusion that the web sleuths that are in our show were the ones who taunted Morbid as the potential killer. And Uh. I just want, I just want to say for the record, you know, nobody in our show, none of those web sleuths had anything to do with cyber bullying Morbid. So it's especially disappointing since again, the whole point of the show is don't cyber bully somebody period, but especially don't jump to conclusions about something based on circumstantial evidence. And a lot of these web sleuths, unfortunately now, have been getting on their social channels a lot of, you know, really intense, mean remarks uh, directed towards them for how dare they cyber bully uh, morbid. (laughs) But the irony is those people who are attacking the web sleuths, first of all, it's unjustified. And secondly, the whole lesson is you shouldn't cyber bully and these viewers are cyber bullying. I'm proud to be a part of Crime Scene, a project that, in my opinion, finally put the Elisa Lamb case to rest and raised some very important questions. Those questions are being addressed piece by piece at the Lord and Arts YouTube channel. You'll find a new playlist there called Response to Netflix's Crime Scene, where I'm pulling together numerous other creators to help clarify and find new mechanisms to make sure that internet witch hunts are not prompted by our content and that we also mitigate other risks that we identify. I see this as a great moment for reflection and growth for all true crime content creators, and I hope others will watch the work that I'm doing and consider implementing some changes, if needed, in their own projects. Thank you so much for listening, and now, let's get on to the show. Hey everyone, it is March 1st, 2021. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Holland, and welcome back to another episode. That's right. Crime After Crime is back. We've got results from last episode. We've got new stories to tell you. All kinds of stuff we're going to dive into. Let's let's not hold it up, Danielle. Let's uh, get right into it. Uh, starting with the voting results. So, uh, Danielle, on the last episode, the the topic we hit was most absurd defense. Danielle told the story of a woman who claimed she was finding someone to kill her husband because she wanted a reality TV show. And Danielle is still shaking her head. Uh, I told the story of a man whose lawyer claimed he was too fat to commit a murder. Hmm. John, I feel like you pushed us into this so fast because you're excited about something. Maybe. <laughs> I feel like this is what's going on here. I may you be might wrong, be right. but let me let me get to the voting results and we'll see. Okay. So on Twitter, I received 34% of the votes and John received 66%. I knew it. Wow. <laughs> I knew you were up to something. Wow. <laughs> and then on the website poll, 28% of the votes went to me and 72% to John. You did it. I did. I finally did. And Danielle, believe it or not, I think it's been a six month dry spell. If I remember correctly, I think you made a mad run at the end of the season where you hit two in a row. Oh, I might have yeah, hit one at the start. I can't remember. Yeah, that's right. I hit one at the start of season three, and then you've been on another run since then. It's been a while, Danielle, and I really need a mug. You got some way to help me out? I'm really sad about this, but I guess I'll pass it over. You deserve it. You told a really good story. (laughs) Too fat to commit a murder, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. You're very deserving. (laughs) There it is. And a big thank you. My winning streak is over. (laughs) It was a good streak, Danielle. Can't knock it. Um, And a big thank you to that amazing attorney who um, kept wanting to call out his client and saying, look at him in the courtroom. Look at him. I know. 
I had so many people that were reaching out to me on Instagram that thought it was hilarious. They were like, why would this man just repeatedly say, look at him? We, we kept getting people oh on Twitter also at Crime After Pod saying the same thing. <laughs> look at him. Just look at him. <laughs> it's that not a defense. Guy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a good defense. No. <laughs> um, all right. On to today's topic. And that is one suggested by several of you. Uh, if you want to make suggestions, you can do that over at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. But the topic is quarantine crimes now danielle and i we kind of go off in our own corners and do research on this stuff but we have to keep connected in terms of what case are you doing because i don't want to do the same case uh danielle you were having a tough time with this and admittedly i I saw why when i started looking into it you want to talk about that yeah i i feel like we both kind of knew this might be an easy research just because I feel like we've all seen our share of crazy crimes that have occurred over the past year and some time now. But I, once I actually started digging into it, I was like, man, this feels like one of those like too soon moments where it's, it's strange. I think, I don't know. It had me just really changing my perspective on a few things. And it was rough because some of these crimes that I was seeing, you know, I saw personally on public happen to people or was something that had directly affected me or, you know, directly affected tons of people. And it just felt so different. I don't know why. It yeah. was it was a very tough thing to look into, especially knowing that so many people were kind of down and struggling and are still struggling. And to see people take advantage of that on such a mass level was really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of I think because we're still connected to it, you know, I mean, we're, we're still going through this all together. Um, some of the stories that you would think kind of sound comedic, all of a sudden it's like, wait, some guy punched his mom cause she hid the toilet paper. Like, you know, pretty, pretty rough, um, considering how close we are to all of this still. Uh, that being said, I do think we came up with some interesting information. I know we've got two really compelling cases to share with you guys. Um, so we're going to press on with it. And, uh, as all of our lives changed in 2020, so did the criminal world. According to the New York times, overall crime dropped 5.3% in 25 large American cities. But as people were forced to stay home, uh, of course, property crime goes down, but people are now confined in close quarters and you have violence increase. Yes. And of course, with people losing their jobs and staying home, some stats are also showing sharp rises in retail burglary as much as a 64 percent increase over previous years. With a shifting criminal landscape, will Danielle and I be able to dig up a few interesting quarantine crime stories from the past year? It took some work, but yes, we did Mm -hmm. it. And uh, I think these stories will both have interesting perspectives for you guys. And uh, I can't wait to share mine. I don't know about Danielle's, but I think it's time we get to know it. You ready? I sure am. And this one was something else. I kept gravitating back to this one and I was hoping there was enough information on it to get a story. And I'm so happy because I feel like we all probably remember pretty vividly when our area in the world first went under some sort of lockdown or quarantine and in Florida, which yes, (laughs) yes, in fact, you guys, my case involves Florida. It all began on March 1st. Now, there was a lot of uncertainty and unease, and many places were kind of walking the fine line of remaining in business, continuing life as usual, and protecting the community while also trying to figure out what all of that meant. And in Florida, like many other places, it really started off as restricting travel, and then one by one, schools were canceled, employees were sent home, and Disney World, a beloved theme park to many, decided to close its doors starting March 15th. And then by March 24th, most areas in Florida were officially put under stay-at-home orders. At this point, many people had no choice but to get comfortable with the fact that they would have to stay at home. But some people definitely saw this as an opportunity. I stumbled across all of the different waves of crime during my research, how organized crime actually slowed initially, and then they realized, hey, less people in businesses, less people in airports, less people in general, it would work to their advantage. I saw people take advantage of price gouging, stealing toilet paper. It even happened close to me. A whole trailer was knocked over full of stolen toilet paper, hand sanitizer, and these stories did really drain me. You know, I lived through not being able to find toilet paper or food for my kids and being scared to even take them out to get anything. 
remember being yelled at actually by a woman after I got the last bottle of hand sanitizer. So I feel like after we've all been in the middle of this really ugly and scary thing that's been this pandemic, I wanted to find something where no one was harmed, but it still fell into the criminal category. And this leads us to a 42-year-old, very interesting man named Richard McGuire. So Richard McGuire is originally from Mobile, Alabama, and he runs a YouTube channel called Southern Pirates Outdoors, which I'm sure many of you are probably going to flock to. Definitely. It sounds interesting. Um, Oh, just wait. You can watch as he explores different swamps, abandoned locations. He sort of runs his own wildlife show where he catches all sorts of animals, everything from alligators to fish, massive turtles. And obviously having a YouTube channel for, you know, that's a passion for exploring the outdoors, quarantine hit him hard as well because Mm. parks are closed, public accesses are closed. The things he loved to do, he couldn't. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it didn't stop him. This initial feeling of defeat quickly turned into an opportunity. So during this time, Disney lovers, for the most part, John can understand this, I can understand this, were driving up to the gates, peering into the land they loved, hoping there would be signs out, speaking of a reopening. But Richard had very different plans than they did. He didn't want to simply sit at the gates of Disney and wait to be let in. He was going to let himself in. And not just to Disney, but to a place called Discovery Island which is an area that has been closed to guests since 1999. Hmm. So Discovery Island, I know John's like, wait a minute. Yeah, what is this? (laughs) I love Disney. What is this? (laughs) I knew you'd love the story. So Disney Island is nestled in the middle of Bay Lake, which is an area within Disney World where many of the Disney hotels are located. It's where Disney Springs is. And for those who are familiar with Disney World, you can see it from like the Wilderness Lodge, Wilderness Campsites, the Contemporary Resort. But from these resorts, it simply looks like an island in the middle of the lake, and many aren't familiar with the history and conspiracy theories behind it. When the island, formerly named Treasure Island, was opened in the 70s, all of Disney World guests could add a visit for a very small extra fee. The island has imported trees and tropical plants from all over the world. It contains dozens of wilderness trails and animal exhibits. It's filled with unique birds like cockatoos, flamingos, cranes, toucans. There were monkeys, lemurs, alligators, I mean, everything that you could think of. And all of these animals were eventually rehomed to the animal kingdom and other zoos. But that's kind of what made it so fascinating to explorers. They just love to rummage through ruins to see what once was. And also, those in search of evidence of dark Disney conspiracy theories. Is that where Walt's head is? There's no (laughs) time. There are so many different theories about this online. But, you know, once the park was closed, it was left unattended and unkept. All of the buildings to this day still remained on the island, including animal enclosures that are now overgrown. Seemingly overnight, the park shut down and not a single thing was taken off of the island other than the animals. That's just like dangling. I mean, the most interesting thing in front of some people's faces. But it's still, as everyone can assume, remained under a very watchful eye of Disney employees. They have over $100,000 in security cameras, and they're still actively monitoring the property after decades. It is a known thing that Disney protects their island at all costs, basically. And because of this, they never really have had an issue with trespassing until quarantine, when empty streets and an empty Disney essentially created the perfect opportunity. So Richard McGuire remembered this island since he was a little kid, fascinated with nature and animals, and he always wanted to go to Discovery Island. And when he began to make YouTube videos of his adventures elsewhere, that was one of the first places that he wished he could go and film for his viewers. It wasn't even really about necessarily being on an abandoned Disney island and the conspiracies behind it, even though through his YouTube videos, which by the way are still up, I'll mention them more later, Um, It was more so about the wildlife and how it's kind of taken over, how the foliage has changed. It it literally feels like a jungle frozen in time. Mm -hmm. Bored with quarantine, with lack of the public eye on his side, he decided to make the trip from Alabama to Florida in April of 2020. He spent weeks preparing for the trip. Another thing you can see on his YouTube channel. He looked over maps. He worked on his fitness. He created a plan to get past Disney security. He even practiced dragging a boat through water while swimming in case it came down to it. He ended up driving with his girlfriend down to Florida in a camo van, inconspicuous. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) 
with his small motorized boat on top. And he spent a few days scoping out the roads through Disney and he filmed this entire process. He ran into tons of security guards who actually were, they were like, you need to leave. You can't even drive through here. Yeah. You can't be filming. I mean, they were being very particular about things. But after having his boat stolen and repurchasing a new one because plans don't ever, you know, go right, he finally decided to hide his vans in the woods behind the wilderness campsites and spent hours dragging his boat to his launch point by cover of darkness. This all happened on April 27th and again, whole thing documented. So after hours of dragging the boat and barely making it to the island, he found a safe spot to dry off and prepare to search the abandoned land. Despite being run down and entirely dark, it was honestly a pleasant change of scenery compared to the walls of his home. And when daylight broke, he headed off to explore the island and even made a joke that this was how he was practicing social distancing. <laughs> and this acre, it's like 11 acres. That's how, It's a huge island. Yeah. He ended up finding papers dated back to 1999, right before they closed, bulletin boards still up, offices still set up with binders packed with studies of animals. All of the animal closures remained intact and some of the bird cages even still had their perches. The plants on the island, we already know I'm a plant person. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> like absolutely stunning. Flowers that looked like they were straight out of Pandora. It was amazing to watch. I watched all that. But a day or two into the trip, he ran into some trouble. While walking through a path, a light came on. Uh -oh. It was CCTV, and he had been captured on it. <sighs> and may I just add, he acted way too nonchalant about it. He was like, oh, what's this? And like walks closer to it. He might as well like tapped on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's in, he's in discovery and mode, Danielle. He's taking it all in. Oh, exactly. And how are you going so to find the hatch down to the secret area where they have Walt's head if you're not looking for lights exactly. and things like that? Yeah. Absolutely. So Disney, obviously, immediately contacted Orange County authorities, handing over the pictures of this man that was wandering their island. Now, like I said, the island itself, 11 acres. It is wildly overgrown. I can't even like really begin to explain it. I hope some of you do go and watch the videos. And at this point, from their perspective, they have no idea what this intruder's intentions are. They don't know if he's armed, you know, where he may be on this really dense jungle island. So it was actually a pretty scary task to search for him. You know, they really didn't know what to expect. And also at this point, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I feel like everyone's on edge. People yeah. are kind of losing their marvel marbles in quarantine. So it was just a lot of unknown. So on April 30th, authorities headed to the island by boat. They surrounded it. They led a few officers on land to search by foot. And footage has actually been released of authorities arriving at the island. And they described it as the best game of hide and seek ever. <laughs> However, one of them also said it was incredibly sketchy. They wandered the park with guns drawn the entire time, calling out to this intruder to surrender himself. Now, authorities on foot were also assisted by helicopters. They were not playing games. They were hoping to get an overhead view of the whereabouts. They even brought in numerous marine deputies that totally surrounded the island and were announcing things over the public address system. Wow. I mean, like screaming out to this man. They had found his rations bag as well as taken his boat. So he essentially was now trapped on this island. And it was a, it was a pretty it was a pretty big deal. They were calling him a fugitive. I mean, it was scary. And in the silence of quarantine, seeing this level of law enforcement screaming through speakers, I'm sure was unsettling to anyone. But despite searching endlessly for the entire day and rain, authorities just had to call it a night after they failed at locating Richard. The jungle was just too thick. It was exhausting. They were literally having to machete their way through everything. But later that night, Richard himself decided to either turn himself in or escape. I've seen both accounts of how this happened. Okay. At this point, Richard knew he needed to leave. And in his videos, you can even watch this, but he decided to inflate his book bag by using empty bottles that had washed up onto the shore. He just blew air into them, stuffed his entire book bag. And you guys, this man swam for over an hour in complete darkness and alligator infested water Crazy. to get off of the island because they had taken his boat. Wow. And when wow. he finally got onto the mainland, his girlfriend called to say 
Authorities found her. I mean, they had circled the park numerous times. Everyone had seen this camouflage van with a boat on top of it. Right. And then they found this camouflage van with no boat on top of it any longer. You kind of piece things together easily. And they basically said that they were going to arrest her if he didn't come and turn himself in. So Richard was apprehended at the scene. It looked like something out of an action movie. Um, and he ended up being charged with trespassing. He claimed to feel unwell, so he was taken to Reedy Creek Rescue, probably because he had not slept at this point for days. He spent an entire night getting to the island. The next day, he immediately was searching into things. And then I believe it was the following day where police showed up. And I mean, he was spending the whole time hiding. Now, this is where authorities questioned him about why on earth he was on the island and why he didn't hand himself over. Richard argued initially that he had no clue he was tra trespassing at all or that the island was off limits to the public. Despite passing by numerous signs blatantly saying, do not come on this island. Yeah. Um, and he also claimed that he had no clue that the entire day authorities were searching for him. He said he was asleep inside one of the buildings and they just happened to miss him. And he missed all the screams from police, the address system demands, the constant droning of the helicopter. Uh, he said that he had arrived that Monday or Tuesday and he was going to hang out on the island for about a week and on something he referred to as a tropical paradise. He had no idea it would escalate to this sort of situation, but authorities got to his phone and they found the truth. They watched all of Richard's adventures on the island, which included him filming authorities searching for him. <laughs> One of the clips, he clearly shows himself like he's like covering himself with leaves He's like, oh, man, I can't let them see me. He whispers into the phone that, you know, the island is surrounded by police and I'm in trouble. He even acknowledged that the um, address system was speaking directly to him. Yeah. He even said quite a few times very confidently that they were never going to find him. So the entire time in the videos, you just see him. He's just hiding. He's like, I would be terrified. I felt so scared the entire time I was watching these. Now, wait. Because so he was just... He got to release the videos, all that footage that he took? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it was bad. He, he eventually did admit that he had gotten overwhelmed, that he knew he was trespassing and that he had planned all this out. And he said that he really genuinely didn't think it was going to be a big deal if he was caught. And he thought that Disney way overreacted. And he has, I think, three or four different parts out on YouTube right now. And you can see how scared he is. You know, he states in there that he had no clue that they would bring in helicopters and marine authorities. And he said that when he initially heard authorities there, he knew he had to turn himself over. But then he sees these paranoid people who are already, you know, scared because of everything happening in the world. Now they're wandering this abandoned island that you can barely see through. And he said the second he saw their guns, he feared for his safety. It he could have ended was, really you know, badly. I mean, it, it could have yeah. ended really badly on that front, but then also mm -hmm. him trying to swim back on his own. And, you know, you're you're on private property at that point. If, if he would have died in that swim back, mm -hmm. they could still be held liable. There's, it's, it's just, this would be totally different if he was going and having this adventure in a state park or, or something like mm -hmm. that. But um, especially because, you know, Disney's very good about um, designing things and engineering a, an experience for people to be there. But yeah. if this is a former attraction, all of the safety precautions and all that stuff, they're not in play anymore. So no. yeah, the liability on this is a mess. And I don't think he was really, I think he wasn't necessarily thinking of it that way. So he was thinking, oh, the worst that will happen is I'll be kicked out and it'll be fine. Right. But seeing this, I mean, I think it was over 15 different officers yeah that were all like screaming to him so he said he just froze he froze and he hid because he was scared that everyone was so on edge and any sort of startling by like popping out of a giant you know tropical tree would end up with him being shot yeah um he did say though that he knew police were only doing their job uh that he was just genuinely scared for his life so later that night basically when he realized that authorities had left the island. He said fatigue set in. He, he said, I was flat wore out. <laughs> Love that Southern <laughs> saying. Um, and that he decided to leave the island. So because of all of this, they had all this video footage of him. He was detained and he was, you know, on a $500 bond. They did end up 
I think putting another trespassing charge on there. And of course, in true Disney fashion, he was banned from all Disney World properties from that point forward. Yeah. Now, Richard was set to go to trial in October, but he was facing up to 12 months in prison. They were considering escalating the charge to felony trespassing, which could land him like five years. But still, between getting out on bond and the trial, he released two of his videos showing his adventures on the island that he calls Escape from Discovery Island. And he said he would be posting the third after the trial was done. And he was even like on to planning his next mini documentary, something about like the American Amazon. This man is just an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> yeah. So once the trial came, he decided to go with a no contest plea, which essentially means you don't admit guilt, but you accept the charges. And this ended up landing him with only a $100 fine. Wow. And his court costs. Wow. So he basically walked away from what had been at the time considered like a fugitive type of situation, basically unscathed. And I personally feel like it has a lot to do with his videos. And again, I really hope a lot of you go watch them because while he was trespassing, he kind of made it very clear that he wasn't there for any sort of harmful purposes. You know, he's like, never, if you're someone who's an urban explorer, I guess he called it. Yeah. You know, don't leave behind trash. Don't make a mess. Do not destroy property. Don't harm animals. He kept, you know, reminding people of that through his videos that he was a responsible explorer, obviously, other than the farm part that he trespassed. But, um, you know, I think that that maybe pushed them to be like, you know what? Yeah. He definitely trespassed, but he, he was he was trying to do to do it in a way where he did not harm anything. And since his adventure, I believe a few others have in fact tried to go on the island when I was watching his videos. I saw like two other people on YouTube had posted about it, Urban Explorers again on YouTube. I'm not sure if their attempts were successful. If you're watching this, please do not do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do yeah. not do this at home. It's a whole thing. Um, I mean, the, the Urban Explorer thing has been around for a while. It's, um, you know, frequently you'll find videos of people going into buildings that have been closed or shut down. Mm -hmm. um, but theme parks is its own kind of subsection of that. Closed theme parks in particular. Um, and th I've watched those videos. I've, uh, you know, they, mm -hmm. that kind of attracts me as well because I want to know a bit of the history of like, you know, oh, what was yeah. this crazy theme park that I, or this aspect of a theme park that I never even knew existed. Um, and there's kind of different ways to get that information. The urban explorer thing is one avenue, but there's also people that are doing almost like historical content, uh, in particular mm -hmm. about Disney. There's a lot of them there. And I watch some of those as well, um, where they'll tell you about, oh, what that island was at the time. And here's the attractions that were on it. And we've got this little clip of videotape from this attraction and this little clip of videotape from that one. Um, it's it's weird because I like the aspect of exploring and kind of looking at the world through that way, but We're all I totally just so curious. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's I, it's a fun mechanism for like YouTube. Mm -hmm. I get it. I, I I get all that. But you know, at the point where you're having numerous law enforcement officials, like a whole deployment that's basically <laughs> coming trying to hunt you down, mm -hmm. um, maybe that's not the best. Maybe it was just not the best target to pick for that type of content. Well, that's why I was thinking to myself the whole time. I was like, because you can clearly see in his videos, there's a point where he's like, I messed up. Yeah. <laughs> like I made a big mistake. And he even says in there, he's like, I risked my life to do this video. And I was almost hoping, I was like, man, may, maybe this will be like your sign that, you know, these videos can be fun and they're exciting. But when you're putting yourself at danger and then in turn, you're putting these large companies mm -hmm. liable for whatever happens to you, you got to be responsible about it. But like the second he mentioned that he was already planning his next big thing, I was just facepalm <laughs> <laughs> immediately. <laughs> And I just, everyone was so shocked that he was even able to put all of these videos out online. They're all still out there. Yeah. It feels like, it's it's crazy. It's insane to watch. I will say, it makes absolutely no sense. It's, There's like no no thought process behind the way he pieced everything together. Yeah. So I still have questions, but it is interesting to watch. It, it is. But it, I wish he would not have created this big of an uproar over it. It's also weird to think about... Um, well, doesn't it breach the terms of YouTube to effectively post a crime? You would think so. 
Yeah, I would seriously think so. So I think if they really wanted to go after him and, you know, get those videos taken down, I think they could. Mm -hmm. But I've heard of other urban explorers and having run-ins with Disney in particular, even the lifetime bans and stuff like that, they do enforce them. Um, but mm -hmm. quite frequently, a few years down the line, if the person approaches them, they'll actually revert it and they'll say, okay, we, we, we think it's enough now and you can go ahead and come back to the parks again. So, um, they're, they're, I think they're generally very good about how they treat people because of the public image problems around that. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, exactly. I don't think it would have been hard for them to pull some strings, contact someone at YouTube and quite honestly, probably get his entire channel shut down if they wanted to. Well, I'm sure they may be using it as an example. Like, look, yeah. he did do it. If you're interested, watch this, but also see what happened. Like we right. sent out, <laughs> yeah, we sent out like a half army <laughs> to come and take him down. <laughs> I mean, you can hear it. He was just, he's on this deserted 11 acre island. And you can just hear the speakers just screaming at him, like surrender yourself. Yeah. It's like something out of a scary movie. It's honestly terrifying. So I'm hoping they're just using it as an example. So no one else does it. But it was it was definitely an interesting story, and that's he really underestimated the lack of security during quarantine, <laughs> because more of them were kind of I'm assuming they're probably just bored. They're like, look, we, right. we don't have much to do. People aren't out on the streets. Crime's going down. So there's this man that's invaded Disney. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> let's go do this. But yep, huge thank you to the Street Journal, Wesh.com, and Al.com for that information. It's definitely an interesting story. It is. It was a really good story. I'm I'm really happy that that you found that one. I know you had to dig deep to to find the right kind of mm -hmm. story, and I think you aced it. I think you nailed that. Um, yeah. Well, I got my work cut out for me. Am I going to be able to match up on that story and maybe try to keep my mug? <laughs> <laughs> for just a little bit. I just want to appreciate it for a little while, Danielle. Uh, we're going to find out right after this quick commercial break. Well, Danielle, we're always going head to head on our show. How about we see who can give our audience the best reasons to check out HelloFresh? Oh, I've got this. Number one, it simplifies my life by cutting out stressful meal planning. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door, everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. That's not bad, but for me, it's the fact that they have more than 25 recipes featured every week, and with their awesome step-by-step -step recipe sheets, I can actually make these recipes myself. Okay, but I've got three words for you. Barbecue pineapple flatbreads. Ooh. They were fast and easy, plus the fresh cilantro and pickled onion is delicious. Mm. Eating healthier has never been easier. With low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options, four out of five HelloFresh customers say that it helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. Take that. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers and you won't be overbuying produce. They send the perfect amount for the recipes, which is easier on the planet. You work on your healthy lifestyle, John. I'm trying to save the planet here. Go to hellofresh.com slash crimeaftercrime12 and use code crimeaftercrime12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Well, I think it's a tie, Danielle. We need our listeners to weigh in by giving Crime After Crime's number one sponsor a try. Go to hellofresh.com slash crimeaftercrime12 and use code crimeaftercrime12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. We promise you're going to love HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Welcome back, everyone. Are you guys ready for another true crime quarantine story? Does to... John get to keep the beautiful mug? I've perfectly perfectly seasoned it. It's basically like a cast iron pan now in <laughs> mug form. It is. It is. <laughs> I've had my time with it. I've shown it my love. <laughs> I'm sure it's treating you well. It sure is. Um, and I want to keep it, so I'm going to work really hard. I'm trying to loosen up here and get ready. All right. <clears throat> now, Danielle, we know that all of us have had to deal with some form of stay-at-home orders. But mm -hmm. what if your home is a bar? Hmm? Then what? All right. That's actually, that's actually a really good question. <laughs> all right. We're going to find out. Alton is a city on the west border of Illinois. 
sitting on the Mississippi River across from Missouri, only about 18 miles away from St. Louis, Alton features a lot of activities to get people out of their homes, including numerous museums, their own symphony orchestra, a casino, and many historical sites, including an area in downtown where a presidential debate in 1858 featured Mr. $5 Bill himself, Abraham Lincoln. Ghost Adventures fans might remember the episodes about the McPike Mansion or the Mineral Springs Hotel. With so many reasons to enjoy the many sights of Alton, can we really blame someone for not listening to those pesky stay-at-home orders? As we were all learning and coming to grips with COVID-19 in March of 2020, the city of Alton was acting fast. By March 17th, they had closed City Hall to the public, suspended late fees on payments for city services, and were setting up alternate methods to request records from the clerk's office. Things got even more serious a few days later when on March 20th, 2020, the governor of Illinois, J.B. Pritz, Pritzker, I'm going to have to say that three times fast, Pritzker, <laughs> J.B. Pritzker. Sounds like someone that would sell snake oil, doesn't he? Ooh, you come to J.B. Pritzker. It sure does. <laughs> uh, he issued mandatory stay-at-home orders to take effect the following day and continue until April 7th. The orders were clear. People could go out for essential activities only. All non-essential businesses had to stop operations and, quote, all public and private gatherings of any number of people occurring outside a single household or living unit are prohibited. He was also very upfront about the challenges of enforcing this order. To be honest, we don't have the resources, the capacity, or the desire to police every individual's behavior, he told the press. Maybe Shannon Walker heard that statement and figured she could still slip out for a good time at her favorite neighborhood bar every now and then. While the stay-at-home orders were heavily publicized, Alton police kept getting calls about one neighborhood bar that seemed to be still in operation on the weekends. As they investigated the complaints, about Hiram's Tavern, officers initially saw no unauthorized activity. The mayor of Alton kept watch on the COVID case count and was receiving reports of large gatherings happening around the city, particularly in the city parks. He ordered the Alton PD to be more strict on enforcing the governor's orders and to start issuing more citations. Quote, our police department has increased its presence in the community but unfortunately, while patrolling, they've noticed that quite a few of our residents are not adhering to the stay-at-home order mandated by the governor, which has now been extended to April 30th. So, the Alton PD steps up their efforts, monitoring the parks and keeping an eye on other locations that might be problematic, like a certain tavern they had heard about previously. Two days after the mayor's directive to issue more citations, at 1 a.m. on Sunday, April 5th, Alton PD heard music coming from Hiram's Tavern and decided to investigate. Upon entering, they found a party. According to them, the party was outside public view. The owner of the bar was there and had an arrest warrant stemming from a domestic battery incident, so he was taken into custody. As the bust was being processed, the mayor got a call from the Alton police chief. Mayor Brant Walker was told that his wife, Shannon, was one of the attendees at the bar. According, <laughs> uh-oh, I'm just going to let let it come out, Danielle. Could you imagine how he was probably like, oh, you got to be kidding me right now. <laughs> yeah, I think anytime the mayor's getting called at one in the morning by the police chief, that's a call that you don't want to necessarily take, but you know you have to. Mm -mm. Then to hear that, oh, wait, <laughs> uh, where is your wife, Mr. <laughs> or your wife, Mr. Mayor? Because um, we think she's think at this bar. <laughs> yeah, and we think we've just busted her. Um, now, get this. According to the mayor, he told the police chief to treat her just as they would treat any other citizen violating the stay-at-home order and to ensure that she received no special treatment at all. So everyone in attendance was charged with reckless conduct, a class A misdemeanor, including the mayor's wife, Shannon Walker. The police arranged transportation for a few people that had a bit too much to drink. I've seen some other quotes from people. Honestly, it seems like the police were being super cool about this whole thing. 
Uh, they were saying that they were talking to them by the end of the night. They were just like standing on the sidewalk. And, you know, the police are arranging transportation for people that can't get home safely. Um, You know, and these are citations. They're not like hauling all these people into jail. I was about to say, this feels like every like teenage party that got busted that I remember in high school. (laughs) That's what this feels like. Yeah. Just want to let you know your daughter's actually at this house right now. And they're like, charge her, throw her in jail. (laughs) teach her a lesson he's like take my wife do it yeah yeah don't give her any special treatment um (laughs) quote if members of our community will not protect each other and will be so brazen as to gather in public places we will be forced to take action like we did this weekend without hesitation said police chief jason simmons in a statement the mayor issued his own statement of course i mean this hits the news and just like wildfire just rips across Mm -hmm. the country uh, my wife is a capable, uh, 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 if I could get it out, <laughs> my wife is <laughs> an adult capable of making her own decisions. And in this instance, she exhibited a stunning lack of judgment. She now faces the same consequences for her ill-advised decision as the other individuals who chose to violate the stay-at-home order during this incident. I am embarrassed and apologize to the citizens of Alton for any embarrassment this, in- this incident may cause our city. And an embarrassment it was. This would go on to be one of the earliest viral news stories of COVID-19, with many people commenting, hmm, I wonder if the mayor was upset that his wife was out partying without him on a Saturday night? And other people saying, his wife seems like a good time. Give her my number after this is all done. But as usual, after the viral story comes back down to reality, There are other details and considerations that go way deeper than the clever headlines. A few days later, Shannon issued a statement. I take the COVID-19 threat very seriously. It is through no one else's actions but my own that resulted in embarrassment for our great city. Shannon then decided to self-quarantine, but had to do so at a secret location due to the amount of hate mail and death threats she was receiving. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she continues... I understand that many are upset by my actions. I also understand that I am not exempt from Governor J.B. Pritzker's statewide order that was placed for all of our safety and am willing to face the consequences of my actions. I hope others will learn from my mistake and that everyone will do their part to flatten the curve of this highly contagious virus. A local publication called Riverbender reported on that's a terrible name for this story isn't it? Yeah. i just caught that mm-hmm. oh riverbender it's because it's at a bend in the mississippi i get it but you know this being an alcohol related story mm-hmm. um they reported on numerous aspects of the case that weren't really picked up on the viral news story retellings there was seven people in total at the tavern Now, obviously, that still breaks the governor's order about all public and private gatherings of any number of people occurring outside a single household or living unit being prohibited. But what if the owner lives there? Reportedly, Hiram lives in an apartment above the back room that they were all found in, and he considers that room his basement. This room is not the main area of the bar. It's actually another room that's set off behind it. And while some people were having drinks, there was no alcohol that was actually being sold through the bar. There were some people that brought their own alcohol Mm -hmm. to this event. Um, And they also didn't exceed the other state mandate that said that gatherings of no more than 10 people are still acceptable, basically, if if you're at a home or a private location. So the owner described it as... He had six friends that came came over to play darts. That was that was basically it. You know, it, it's not like he had employees there. They weren't running the register. He wasn't even using the front area where the alcohol is served from to to give these drinks to people. None of that was going on. Yeah, because originally I had an entirely different impression of what was happening. <laughs> I was yeah. picturing something so different <laughs> than that. Yeah, like so different. No, and I've seen pictures of this room they were in. In one way, I'm almost wondering, like, what the heck is the mayor's wife hanging out? I mean, it's like it is like a basement. It's like yeah. it's it's a finished basement, but it, it's. I used to hang out in some dive bars, Danielle, and let me just say that this room that they were hanging out in, yeah, like dive dive bar. Like you wouldn't go there. <laughs> There's no windows. 
the the walls are all painted red. It's just this big open square room, but you can tell that they don't use and it as part it. of the main bar. There's no seating. There's no tables. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's 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 another thing when you actually see the details on the story. And I know a lot yeah. of you listeners are probably saying, "Oh, I already I know about this story. I know about the viral thing." Yeah, but phew, we're not but done with the details. Yeah, we're oh, not done boy. with the details on this yet. Uh, The police chief says uh, Hiram Lewis does not have a legal occupy permit for his upstairs apartment, but Lewis says that he will get inspections and permits done once he's done renovating that living space. Uh, He told the Riverbender, quote, I would like to apologize to the city of Alton, the mayor, the mayor's wife, the police chief, and the people of Alton. Even though we were not open to the public selling food or drinks, it was still wrong and irresponsible to allow my friends to congregate in my establishment. I also feel sorry for Shannon and her treatment. But Danielle, that's not the end of the story. It seems there may have been other factors at play in terms of Shannon's self-quarantine location and maybe even why she was out at that bar in the first place. In a video I was posted, gonna ask that. Yeah, like what how did the mayor not realize, you know, where's your wife at midnight on a Saturday? And Mm -hmm. do you not know about it? Like what's, what's the conditions around that? Um, Brant Walker posted on his Facebook page. uh, He revealed that he and his wife were actually living apart stating quote, there are and have been issues in my marriage. It is clear that my wife faces some very difficult issues, and I will do everything I can to ensure she receives the help and support that she needs to overcome them. People who face challenges should not be ridiculed, but instead shown compassion. I ask for your compassion and understanding for my family as we work on these private issues that are unfortunately now in full public view. The Riverfront Times summed it up in an article where they stated, sounds like social distancing might not be a problem at the Alton mayor's house for a little while. Oh my goodness, man, they took a stab there. A lot of the press really did around this. And that's why I'm trying to throw so much attention to Riverbender. Mm -hmm. And and honestly, I I don't want to get on too much of a pedestal or, or soapbox here, but those local publications that can actually afford the time to report on these things accurately give us such a different understanding of cases just like this. Oh, yeah. We really, I mean, and they're dying off, unfortunately, those types of publications. So uh, if, if you're at a spot where you can help support your mm-hmm. little local news channels or publications or radio stations, Please help them. We, we need to hold on to that level of media because the national version of this story, look at what it is. And now yeah. we're hearing from the local level and it's something much, much different. Yeah. And we talk about that all the time, how we see these crazy headlines. Yeah. And like, the, the, you know, there's sometimes we go through about 15 articles where it all seems like the same copy paste and it seems very basic. And then we get deeper into it and we're like, wait a minute. Right. This whole history is here behind this. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so and it brings it's very it, fair, especially bring, in this situation. Yeah, and and it brings it back down to the reality of people. I mean, look, we're talking about mm-hmm. here a relationship that's having trouble, that could exacerbate um, issues, substance abuse issues, if people are yep. already kind of geared towards that, or even if they're not geared towards that. I've I've gone through a divorce before. I know mm-hmm. I was hanging out in bars way too much around around that whole process. Um, and, and we don't know the, even with this local coverage, we don't know the full extent of what Shannon's dealing with, but, yeah. um, she has requested a jury trial and that was granted her lawyer, Travis Noble has made some statements that there's a lot more going on with this story than what has been publicly disclosed. Here's a quote from him. We are obviously not going to plead guilty in this case. This will be a trial. We will have an opportunity to cross-examine both the chief and the mayor about the chief's report and contradict some things in the police report. There is more to this story. Of course, that statement raises many questions, but we're going to have to Mm -hmm. wait until the trial to find out more. In the meantime, Mayor Brant Walker has some work cut out for him. In April of 2021, just next month, he's running for another term as mayor. Oh, boy. Yeah. Big thank you to Riverbender.com, IllinoisPolicy.org, NBC News, The Herald and Review, Belleville News, Democrat, The Telegraph, Riverfront Times, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. 
I don't know, Danielle, what do you think about that last statement? What do you think the lawyer is trying to say? I mean, initial. okay, I will say this, and this is obviously just from the information we have and like my current perspective, but yeah. initially I was very thankful that the mayor was like, look, no one's immune to this. You know, I'm not going to get my wife off the hook just because, you know, she's my wife. But to me, it almost feels like he did that to kind of get at her because she, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, was she staying there with this man because that's where she had to live if they were separated at the time, if they weren't staying together? You know, how much wrong was she technically doing there? If that's just where she was living at the time. Or I feel like there is. There's way too much background information. And initially where I felt like he was kind of doing the right thing, I almost feel like now was just him trying to get at her. I think, and that landed her in a very bad legal position unfairly, possibly. Yeah, Again, it, I don't have all the information, so I don't know. But That's the only defense that I would think yeah. um, could be being pulled together. And there is something interesting about this story. It took me a lot of, of looking through all kinds of different articles about this to get a sense of why the police, when they first went to that location, weren't able to detect that it was being used. But then all of a mm -hmm. sudden on that one particular night, which is only two days after the mayor says, hey, we're going we're, we're to start enforcing this policy differently, then they're able to detect that that location is being used reportedly. And it actually came from a quote from the chief because mm -hmm. he's saying they said they heard music. It, this could be a whole different thing if you consider the fact that yeah. um, you know, the mayor was upset, knew where his wife was likely to be, and said, hey, go check mm -hmm. on this location. And if it's, you know, something's going on, just cite everyone there. I don't know. I don't know. Oh man, talk about like all your dirty laundry just being thrown out to the public when you were yeah. unprepared for it. It's terrible. It's it's terrible at, at, on both sides because I've also seen a lot of quotes from the mayor. He's a very good speaker. Um, mm -hmm. the, the way that he's approaching the subject. He, he also said this other quote, I didn't include it here, but he talks about the fact that everyone gets knocked down at some point, that everyone yeah. has to deal with something in their life at, at some point, and we really need to help support them and rally around them. The, the message that he's putting out, at least publicly, seems to line up with kind of this version of the story that he really didn't expect her yeah. to be there and she got caught. It's really that last Maybe. twist of what her lawyer's saying, where all of a sudden it's kind of like, well, and especially you're going to, yeah, yeah, you're going to put the chief of police and the mayor on the stand for a citation about someone violating a stay at home order. Like, where's this going? So I'm really curious to see how it all shakes out. I, I don't know what to expect. I know I was about to say, do you have any idea when... I mean, at this point, everything is so delayed and messed up. There's no telling when the trial. No, she when she asked for the jury, um, that came mm -hmm. through in July. And I was hoping to okay. see something since then. And I haven't. So, yeah, I think everything's just backlogged in terms of them processing this stuff. I'm pretty sure, especially. Oh goodness. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, especially with a good publication like Riverbender on this, that there's going to be an update um, when when that trial actually happens with with the outcome. But it could yeah, also be. I feel very invested in it, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I know. When this happens, I need to know. Yeah, um, it could also be that you know, considering that the mayor is running for another term and all that stuff, I don't know if the trial's been kind of like, hey, let's uh, move that to the other side of, of the election. Yeah, more than likely. Yeah. Because you don't need that to be, you know, happening right before, or right during. That's, even, that's even, probably not a good look. <laughs> yeah. Even even if there's nothing terrible going on in this, just having an article yeah. that comes out about mayor on witness stand, it's for an election cycle. That's enough for it to just. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not going to go well. So that's oh my, my story. Gosh. I feel like we got I feel like we got very good ones and I'm I'm very pleased with that. And yours has a very interesting unique twist to it that I wasn't necessarily expecting. And I actually think it perfectly portrays a lot of situations people have been in since quarantine started. You know, there's all these rules, there's a lot of different blurred lines that I think some people may just not understand. And I feel like that could have landed a lot of people in legal trouble they weren't expecting to be in. You know, when you're trying to throw together all these different restrictions so last minute you can only do it so flawlessly right. you know where people you know who shouldn't be affected are so yeah. it's definitely been an interesting kind of learning curve to see i know where i live in particular there's been a lot of people that have gotten in a lot of trouble 
for breaking different quarantine rules. But here, it's not blurred lines. <laughs> it's people that don't care. I think there was someone a few months ago that held an entire concert with, I mean, just, I think it was a few hundred people. So It's funny you say but that. This is, I literally had a nightmare last night about oh I was my. going to my first concert and I was like, there's going to be 9,000 people here. And I was literally standing in a line heading to the door and I started freaking out about, do I want to mm -hmm. be in a room with 9,000 people right now? Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's so, it's, it's so interesting. And I don't know. That's why I appreciate your story though, is because there are these people that, you know, are very directly disobeying, you know, restrictions, laws, and it's kind of varying all over the place. But it's, it's interesting when there's something like that where someone could be living there, but yeah. then there's this issue of, is it actually supposed to be used as a living space? And is she there because she's staying with him? Or it's just very interesting. The, the blurred lines can create a lot of issues in the legal system, as we all know very well. So, yeah, and it's interesting to see that kind of play out. Yeah. And I don't, you know, there was other people there. I mean, it could be that she was meeting mm -hmm. up with some other, if, yeah, if it is even a absolutely. romantic interest. I mean, who knows? When you're going through a separation like that, it's not like your first yeah. instinct is, oh, I want to go meet someone else to be romantic with. Sometimes you're just looking for a good support group or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, people to have a drink with. A distraction, just someone to, yeah. yeah Play so. some darts. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Whew. Felt some aggression. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know we were going to go so much into my history with that story. <laughs> Feels like it was cutting a little close there, John. Um, but no, if, I mean, if there's something that helps gives insight to that, mm -hmm. no, I'm, I'm all for it. It is that time where we get to the extra stories, the things that weren't quite big enough for us to do the whole big story on, but we still want to tell you about. And we're starting with one from Danielle. All right, you guys, this one, I actually wanted to do my whole story on and there just wasn't enough information. But <laughs> over the course of June 7th and 8th, 2020, 21 separate individuals from Los Angeles all traveled to Hawaii. Now, I don't know if any of you guys know, but Hawaii has some very, very, very serious, very strict restrictions. Actually, when I first typed in, I think looking for this, it was like Hawaii, 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 Hawaii. Um, but all 21 individuals signed the proper documents agreeing that they would go through the mandatory 14-day quarantine. Now, from the outside, this appears to be a somewhat normal trip. I'm sure 21 people, it's common for them to come into Hawaii. However, these were not 21 strangers, which is where this takes a weird turn. It turned out to be a group of individuals who called themselves a family with a leader. And their purpose was basically to get away from Los Angeles to start their new life after quarantine in this fresh new area. And it was quickly connected that half of them claimed to be vacationing, stories weren't adding up, the other half said that they were moving to the island, things weren't making sense. And all 21 of them ended up together in the same Airbnb, which was obviously going against quarantine protocols. Basically, they had just been sneaking into Hawaii, not following any of the rules. So they ended up being arrested for this, along with the Airbnb owner, because the Airbnb actually wasn't even supposed to be used at the time they had mm -hmm. ceased all short-term rentals yeah so the group because of this it caused this huge media uproar had to make a youtube video attempting to explain that they were not a cult because the way the media took it was this cult came to hawaii <laughs> 21 <laughs> individuals and they're breaking quarantine but they very adamantly said that they are not a cult they're actually a tribe known as the carbon nation Needless to say, they were all removed from the island and threatened to be arrested again if they returned. But I have looked into the Carbon Nation, and most of the consensus is that this is some sort of strange cult. And they basically were mad about restrictions here in L.A., so they all flew down and tried to say, forget it. Well, they didn't do Hawaii. the research you did in terms of where <laughs> they were going, apparently. <laughs> No, not at all. I mean, it's a huge thing in Hawaii, man. They're yeah. kicking people out left and right. I think there's only one area right now where any travelers can go at all without a quarantine, mm. like a mandatory one. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I like that. Yeah, we're not a cult, we're a tribe. Okay. <laughs> they did. They so deeply tried to defend themselves. But I mean, when you're like, oh, well, we're like a family with a leader, I'm like, do you not know what this sounds like? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the this is the worst way to describe yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That leader's name isn't Manson, is it? Exactly. Um, yeah. 
Well, uh, here's one that I know I've, I keep getting personal with these stories. This one kind of hits personally too, because I've kind of had this thought lately, but, uh, the Taney town police department in Maryland issued an urgent message on their Facebook page in the middle of 2020. It seemed they found a disturbing new criminal trend developing quote, please remember to put pants on before leaving the house to check your (laughs) mailbox. You know who you are. This is your final warning. (laughs) And I'm not kidding, Danielle. I remember the moment. It was like two or three weeks ago where I was like, oh, I haven't checked the mail in a little while. Oh, no, not, you know, oh, can I just run out and check the mail? (laughs) You're like, well, will anyone really see and or care? Right. I opted against it. Did you think I can get away with this? I did opt against it, but um, it it did occur to me. You know, I've probably disturbed many people on my street because I, too, just don't care anymore. And so I'll go down early in the morning and, like, my hair is curly. You know, if you have curly hair, you literally have to wear a bonnet. Like, mm. I look insane with a bonnet and a rope and, like, <laughs> socks with sandals. And I'm, like, walking down to the end of my driveway. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's like, good grief, lady. <laughs> go put some pants on. Get yourself together. <laughs> yeah, and remember, people, there are doorbell cameras now. So you just making your little quick run to the uh, mailbox in your in your skivvies might pop up on someone's doorbell camera and then pop up on TikTok. So watch out. <laughs> yeah. Or in my case, where I'm literally recording myself do it. And so I'll go back inside to an alert on my phone and I see myself and I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> why did I do this? <laughs> oh, man. Now we're on to... One of my favorite stories. This is some dedication right here. 28-year-old Dale McLaughlin couldn't stand being away from his girlfriend in quarantine. You know, so he decided no rules, no restrictions, or even the Irish Sea could keep him away from her. Dale bought a jet ski, knowing that travel by sea was probably the most likely way to stay hidden from authorities, which is very creative. Despite never operating a jet ski before, never crossing the Irish Sea, And you know what? This man didn't even know how to swim. Didn't even know. I'm telling you, this is dedication. Yeah. He headed off on his journey through what ended up being very rough seas. I think it was supposed to be a 30-minute trip. It took him four and a half hours. (laughs) What? (laughs) He probably thought he was dying so many times along the way. (laughs) He, He did end up safely arriving at the Isle of Man. He walked 15 miles after this all the way to his girlfriend. And they did have an amazing weekend together. They spent, you know, the night on the town after this life-threatening trip. I'm sure it was very romantic, except he ended up being arrested for breaking quarantine restrictions. I wasn't able to find how he got caught, but I think it's hilarious. (laughs) It is. It is kind of romantic, though, ultimately, you know. Um, it is. Are you joking? Imagine <laughs> like eventually getting married and telling your kids this. Like back in the right. pandemic yeah. of 2020, he jet skied across the sea for me. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't even swim, but I was so in love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Imagine well, if he got there and she was like, oh, dang, I wasn't really that into you. I know. I know. <laughs> Knocks on the door and there a guy answers. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a nightmare. Um, for this next story, I'm going to have this little guy sit on my chest. I know for the podcast audience. Oh, uh, I love him. Yeah. You, you don't know what it is. But Danielle, you want to tell them what? Uh, That's little baby Yoda. It is. It's, it's little baby Yoda. And and maybe he comes into this story at some point. Texas oh, Parks. <laughs> <laughs> Texas Parks and Wildlife came up on a disturbing scene. A couple was caught digging at a Native American burial site. When they came up on the married couple, the man came out of a large hole and said, I'm not searching for arrowheads, and I hate diggers. (laughs) It sounds like my son when I catch him doing something wrong. (laughs) It directly states what he's doing, but he's actually not doing it. I'm not doing that, yeah. (laughs) So uh, he explained that he and his wife were actually on a date As the officer put them in a patrol vehicle, he found that they had several artifacts in their possession hidden in gardening gloves, and maybe more disturbingly, a baby Yoda pipe. Now, the man said, (laughs) The man said that the baby Yoda pipe was for CBD oils, but the game warden also found a small crystal substance that he suspects was meth. 
Cops were called in, and when the couple were being transferred to the local jail, the husband aggressively coughed at the officers, telling them it was coronavirus. He got several charges, including harassing a public servant. Also, in the uh, while they were processing the couple, they put the baby Yoda pipe up on top of the car. You know how s- the cops will frequently do mm-hmm. that? Uh, I think when they were talking to the wife, someone seems to have knocked the baby Yoda pipe down on the ground and smashed it. Ooh. So I'm sure there's I'm some sure type they of... I'm too happy with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's some kind of uh, destruction of evidence charge that might be coming with that as well, but... Well, I yeah. can't get over the fact that he says he wasn't, I'm not, I am not looking for arrowheads. No, I'm not. Seriously. <laughs> terrible. I mean, just what a terrible thought. I mean, you're digging at a burial site, a Native American burial yeah. site. What are you doing? I don't know. That whole, everything about that. <laughs> and then coughing and saying it was coronavirus. Good grief. That's yeah. like a desperate attempt. And then the scary thing is, is you don't know if they're being serious or not because there's so many people that just genuinely don't care. Yeah. Oh and my that, gosh, that's that, a nightmare. That was a weird trend in some of the stories I was looking into too. People coughing on food or licking food, licking deodorant. Like what? How is what? that? What? Yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah. One of them, someone was licking deodorant. I think it was being filmed for being put online or something. It's, yeah. There's all kinds well, of... Well, this is absolutely ridiculous. People are crazy. All of y'all that are crazy, just cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. the only one that spit on everything. Yeah. Like, are you not aware of how ridiculous you look right now? And like how much of a danger you potentially are? Could you just stop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, if you're mentioned on but... this show, you're not, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> I know exactly. If we're talking about you, like it's intriguing, but cut it out, right. please. You're doing this is all bad. Before we end today's episode, our friends over at Crawl Space, Tim and Lance, want to tell you guys about what they're currently working on. On February 9th of 2004, 21 year old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Mora's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004. This is Missing. After all these years, once the podcast started coming out, we started getting tips. One of her husband Richard's family members came forward, specifically asked us to search this spot. It's a 31 foot vertical shaft. And then it went over and then it went through a crevice. And then there's another room. How close was this area to where Erica went missing? Probably two miles. There were sightings of keys within a mile of a diner that she worked at a few weeks before she went missing, um, asking people how deep Lake Champlain was in certain points and asking people if um, anyone would know they disappeared. Uh, You know, just common small talk you make with strangers. Wow, so that was the other job that Brianna Maitland had. She was driving really crazy on the way home. She was tailgating, driving fast. She seemed to be irritated about something all of a sudden. Everything was fine, but all of a sudden, and I think it had to do with that phone call. I was in the dentist chair and the local radio station came on. And that's how I found out. It was Archer Ray Johnson is missing. And I was, okay, that's not a name that you hear. You're in a small town. I knew it was my dad. But I think sometimes we all need to be reminded that for every day that you don't do something, that you don't act or you aren't on the offensive, that someone is in great anguish. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM. Search for Missing in your favorite podcatcher. All right, you guys, it's that time. Who do you think is going to win this month? You guys get to vote. Who told the best quarantine crime story? And you can vote at our Twitter account, at CrimeAfterPod, for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you can also head over to www.CrimeAfterCrimePodcast.com and you can vote there. We always have a link in the description box below. I will say you usually can click the I and a link will pop up. But for some reason, the past few times I've tried to put it there, 
I kept saying error and it would sometimes show up on the video when I would check and sometimes it wouldn't. So just to be clear, yeah. you can always find it in the description box because it's it's been a little finicky lately. Yeah, I've been double checking that and I've I've actually had to add it in the past few for some reason. Maybe it's, yeah, it keeps I don't saying know. Error. Yeah, sometimes it's getting through and sometimes it's not. But it's always in the description box down below. Or mm -hmm. you can remember the super easy to remember crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. Um, if you go there, you'll also find all the links you ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, which, hey, we need them, keep them coming, uh, how to join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store. As always, thank you so much to our patrons. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It's like John and I's breath of fresh air mm -hmm. where you get to learn a lot about us and very embarrassing things nine <laughs> times out of 10. Plus all of our new patrons get a special personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. We are going to be back on April 1st with an episode we've been talking about for a little while. Danielle's got a big giant smile on her face right now. We're calling it the ganja made me do it. Oh man, I can only imagine. Yeah. I hope we're, we're there's no way we both aren't going to find fantastic stories. I'm pretty sure. There's a big history, I think, when it comes to the ganja making <laughs> me do it. <laughs> it is going to be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. But you guys, this is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the wonderful John Lorden. If you enjoyed this show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell them. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime and they should check it out. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.